So in the Christian Bible, which is a story all about God, all about Jesus, in fact, um, the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, and I'm, I'm not going back to the Old Testament right now, it's true there too, but specifically between Jesus when he, he came to us in the flesh and his disciples, is it, depicted as very close, very intimate and loving. The Bible demonstrates this uh, in that the Old Testament scriptures kind of set the scene before Jesus. Um, we see in Song of Solomon, we see from Psalms of David, his heart and in intimacy with God. We see from messages of the prophets and God encountering Moses, which is a very personal encounter. Uh, we see all sorts of evidence even before Jesus. The Old Testament are the scriptures that were written before Jesus, uh, before he came. Uh, those scriptures all also depict uh, an intimacy and, in fact, a building and growing intimacy with God throughout the scriptures as God reveals himself more to mankind. Um, in the New Testament, Jesus dra dramatically personalizes that relationship in the person of Jesus. So it, he becomes, he is God with us. So people are literally walking with God among them. While, like, like Adam and Eve were originally designed to be in the Garden of Eden, God walking among them, right? So um, Jesus has now come to the people, just like God existed in the, in the um, tabernacle in the Holy of Holies in the middle of the camp of Israel when they came out of, out of Egypt. Um, Jesus now came to us right into the middle of, of society. Um, and, and we could look upon him. We could see him. So uh, Jesus radically personalizes that relationship with God. Uh, and we see how close he walked with his dis disciples. So uh, the Christian Bible shows us two relationships that I want to point out here um, in terms of relationship with God. We see a corporate relationship in both the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures. Uh, a corporate relationship, which is God and his collective people. So, you know, people as a, as a, a general body or collection, right, who follow God uh, and their relationship with him as a group, um, that's a corporate relationship. And then there's also very personal relationship with God that's depicted in both the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is a personal intimacy. So what does that word intimacy mean, though? Well, this is just a pulling from the Oxford Dictionaries via Bing search. Uh, close familiarity or friendship closeness is, is one way to define it. Um, the example given here is the intimacy between a husband and a wife. And it doesn't usually get much deeper than that in human terms between humans right uh, between a husband and a wife they know each should know each other really well and better than e even their closest friends in many cases so if we look at some of the cinnamon synonyms though we see that that it's wow it can be really really um really really deep right um we we see familiarity, confidentiality, rapport. I mean, there, there's just, these aren't exactly the same things, but, but there are other words you might think of um, being a part of intimacy here. So we're talking about a very, very deep personal relationship. It's not just a book knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. It's not just a set of rules. It is knowing one another's hearts as well. So intimacy, this is my personal opinion. I'm not a scholar. This is my personal experience and opinion. Intimacy is very critical to your walk with Jesus. I'm going to give you a scripture here that um, 
that points out one reason why. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, that that word new is ginosko, something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if my pronunciation is correct, but it's ginosko in, in the Greek that is translated from. So here we see Jesus teaching, and, and I'm not giving you this scripture as an example of like, like to set any fear or judgment or anything, um, but, it, but we should all take heed at it that that Jesus seems to be saying that there's there's something about knowing him and him knowing us. So he says that to enter heaven, the people who will enter the heaven enter heaven are the ones who do the will of of our Father in heaven. right? That's right here in the scripture, very plain. And um, and that to do the will of our Father, we need to know his will. We need to know him. And then he says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. These are people who weren't doing the will of the Father. Maybe they were doing miracles, but, but they weren't walking in the ways of Jesus, most likely. That's what I'm guessing. He says, I never knew you. So we know it's a fact that Jesus knows us better than anyone else in terms of God knows our heart. He gave us, he made us, he knows our heart, he knows us better than anyone else. But here Jesus says, some will be told, I never knew you. So there's something, there's something more that, that he seems to be looking for. And, and I believe that's intimacy. I believe that's us desiring him, us seeking him, us wanting personal, intimate, emotional, heart knowledge of him and to give him our hearts. So intimacy is about knowing Jesus. It's about his heart, his mind, his ways, knowing as much as we can, not in head knowledge only. There is some head knowledge, but this is really about the heart. This is about the emotion, about, oh, just, it's about love. It's about loving Jesus, loving Jesus, loving him deeply from, from our heart, from a place of intimacy. And it's about letting Jesus know us too. So it's about opening our hearts to him as well, trusting him to see the deepest, darkest places of our heart and to come in and, and heal it, to, to actually give, give us the places of, that are scary to us, the, the, the hurt and the pain, you know, to give bitterness over to him and, and forgive instead. And, you know, it, it's about it's about letting him know us as well, even though technically he already knows our hearts, right? The Holy Spirit searches our hearts. God, God knows our hearts. But there's something more we see from the scripture in, in Matthew, right? We, when we desire to open our hearts to him, it says something about what we feel for him, what our belief is in him and our trust is in him. So I want to walk through a couple of scriptures real quick, about four or five scriptures here. And uh, just to illustrate more, uh, the first one here in Exodus, I'm going to read the Lord. When, when you see the Lord in all caps, it is, um, it is basically uh, masking the name of, of God, which was YHWH or Yahweh or, or Yahweh or some some people believe the the vowels were closer to uh, like Yehovah. Um, you know the the reality is ancient Hebrew apparently didn't have the vowels written down uh, with with the consonants. So so it's a bit of a guess to to determine what it is. But Hebrew scholars, I'm I'm told, uh, mostly believe that that it was probably close to something like Yahweh, um, but I, I don't believe God gets mad if you call him 
Yehovah, Yehovah. I mean, ask him, ask him, don't ask me. Uh, personally, I, he calls himself several different names, uh, including like Jesus, right? In, in the scriptures, Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel, right? So I don't think it's personally, um, you know, a bad thing if you're not sure what, how, how to pronounce this, because the scholars apparently aren't either. <laughs> um, but I'm going to pronounce it Yahweh. And I'm going to do that because I want to personalize this. Uh, it got translated as the Lord because of more uh, Hebrew tradition, a uh, Jewish tradition, way, way, way back before the time of Jesus, as far as I know. I want to personalize it, though, because I believe God wants us to know his name and delight in his name. Then, then Yahweh came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to third and fourth generation. So here we see um, God revealing, like, this is heart knowledge. This, is, this isn't just head knowledge. God wants us to know his goodness. He wants us to know it. This is all about the goodness of God. And this is not something he had revealed to mankind before. Israel was being led through the desert, through the wilderness, on the way to the promised land. And God encounters them and reveals a level of information um, about himself, including his name, that, that had never been revealed to mankind before, even to Abraham before before him. So he's, he's gradually, you know, opening opening the kimono, if you will, um, in showing us who he is in increments. And then eventually when we get to Jesus, it's, it's like Jesus makes it very plain to us. But here we see the goodness of God. And it may sound like the, the last part, the last sentence, which is about his justice, is harsh. But it, it's really not. It's really his goodness. Because if he didn't have consequences for for wrongdoing imagine what the world would look like i mean it, it's just his character is he is good and good in every imaginable way and his goodness outweighs judgment right his mercy outweighs judgment but he is just he can't he can't ignore sin he's always been just and he always will be just so that's kind of what that last last part's about. It's all about his goodness. I, I wanted to show this because I wanted you to see how God himself, even long before Jesus, is trying to, to get us to realize how beautiful and loving he is and how good he is with a picture of how he comes basically face to face with Moses. He, I mean, he's in the cloud, but he's, he's in fright in front of Moses having this intimate, basically, conversation with him. And he reveals his name and he reveals his character to us because he wants us to know. So it's an invitation for us into intimacy. This next scripture is one of the apostles who, who followed Jesus writing to the church in Philippi. But whatever gains, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So here we see the apostle describing how everything is meaningless 
compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Of knowing Christ Jesus so that we may be found in him. Not found, just found by him, found in him, in him. In other places in the New Testament, it said that, that we are hidden in Christ, right? Um, he's talking about a deep knowledge. And, and that word knowing is gnosis, um, something like that. I, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. But the Greek word is right there on the screen. And it's it's meaning a, an under a deep understanding or knowledge of of Jesus and and the word for found is is really it, it's hierisco and it it's meaning here to to find or discover meet to to obtain to or or to be found um, found in so it's it's really about like knowing who Jesus is in a way that allows us to be found in his character, in him in some way. Um, and the last part of the scripture is, is showing that the goal is that to participate in the suffering of Jesus, in, in other words, to die, to, to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, which is what he told us to do, to die to the old stuff, to die to the ways of this world, and sometimes that hurts. Sometimes that's painful. But to, to die to those ways, to take up the ways of Jesus. As if we were died with him on the cross and raised to life with him from the grave. Because that's actually what happens when we turn and follow Jesus and believe in him. We get new life. We are raised in new life and the old is, the old is past. The old is dead. Now, two scriptures from the Old Testament that are just beautiful. The one of the Psalms, I believe, of David: "Search me, O God; search me, God, and know my heart. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting." Psalm one thirty nine. And then Jeremiah, the prophet, says, I, I will, this is God speaking through Jeremiah to his people. I will give, or about his people, I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. Okay, so this word know in both scriptures is yada. I think I got that pretty close. I tried to listen to the pronunciation. I think that's pretty close. Yada. Um, anyways, it's a deep knowing. So when there, there's quite an extensive list of, of meanings in the, uh, in the Strong's or in, in the um, Word Study Dictionary, but, but it's, it's a deep knowing. It basically implies a really deep understanding to the point that um, it's such an intimate relation or knowledge to the point that sometimes this word, same word could be used to describe sexual relations, which is very intimate, of course, right? That's not what it's describing here. It's not describing sexual relations. It's describing the kind of intimacy that maybe even a husband might have with a wife, a deep knowing in a wife with her husband. So that's really powerful to think about that. This is, this is even in the time before Jesus, God speaking with these powerful words of deep intimacy. And then in John, which is, uh, this is Jesus speaking again. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So this word, no, is ginosko. Something like that, ginosko. Um, you can see from the definition here, it's, uh, it also, like yada, 
implies a really deep understanding uh, and a very, very intimate relation or knowledge. And this same word, ginosko, also can, in different contexts, be used to describe sexual relations. It's not describing that here, but it is it is clearly describing a beautiful, deep intimacy and in knowing. And of course, Jesus in, in the, the framing, even in the Old Testament, the framing of, of God's people in relationship to him, and especially the followers of Jesus to Jesus, is Jesus is the groom and the followers is a bride, right? Like husband and wife, groom and bride, um, which which implies a, a sort of marriage in, in which is an invitation into deep, deep intimacy. All right. So that was a really quick overview of some scriptures and, and teaching to try to give you an idea of why this is important, intimacy with Jesus. And I hope it's helped you. If not, leave comments and tell me what you still don't understand. That's fine. Maybe I'll try to do another teaching on it. Um, Hey, I might not even know the answers. You might challenge me to go find out. So that'd be great. Um, three questions, though, for you. If, if you're wondering, is this prayer for you? Well, one, are you a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is, and is the only way to God the Father? This is really intended for believers of Jesus uh, as the Lord and Savior and the only way to the God the Father. Um, that's not saying you couldn't pray it. Uh, you know, if, if you don't believe in Jesus, but it's, it's written as if you do believe in Jesus already. Um, are you walking on a path of deepening personal intimacy with our beloved Jesus, who is Lord of all and the way to the Father? If you aren't walking on a path of deepening personal intimacy right now with him, do you desire it? This is, this is really for people who desire that personal intimacy. You know, to pray this from the heart, you, you need to have some level of desire, um, even if it's just a, a curiosity and a kind of like, I think, I really think I need that, but I'm, I don't really know how to relate to what it is, but, but I think I need that. So I think I need to pray it. Um, that's okay. Right. But, but some kind of desire in your heart, I would say, it's probably, probably the right place to, to pray this prayer from. And if you already do have a path uh, of personal intimacy with Jesus, maybe you don't need to pray the prayer, but you could still pray the prayer. That's that's fine. I don't think it hurts anything. Um, do you, the third question is, do you yearn for that deeper connection? And by that, I mean like a heart bond, you know, a heart bond to Jesus, but, but not know how to get there. So if if you know you want it and you know you need it, but but you're just not sure of the right path, well, you know, pray the prayer and ask Jesus to show you, okay? So if you do feel led to go pray this prayer, we're going to do that right now. God bless you. Let's get on with it. Thank you.